so the the Abbasids who are often fighting wars with the Byzantines wanted to present themselves as being enlightened rulers and contrast themselves to the superstitious and kind of corrupt and debased culture of Byzantium. And what better way to do that than to claim their intellectual inheritance for yourself? So that's that's another part of it. There's probably more to say we could say about that, but that's like a good sampling of reasons why they were interested in it. All right. Peace, people, and welcome to another installment of Real Talk with Tehran and Roxana. I'm your host, Tehran, and together we'll embark on a captivating journey back in time to explore the intersection of two remarkable civilizations and the profound impact of their intellectual exchange. In the vast tapestry of human history, there are moments of vital importance that shape the course of knowledge and spark intellectual revolutions that transcend borders and time. One such transformative era unfolded during the medieval period where the ancient wisdom of Greece encountered the vibrant world of Arabic scholarship. What is famously known as the Greco-Arabic translation movement emerged as a bridge connecting the profound insights of ancient Greek thinkers with the burgeoning Islamic world. It was a time when intellectual curiosity and a thirst for knowledge traversed the Middle East with scholars and translators tirelessly working to unlock the treasures of Hellenistic philosophy, science, mathematics, and literature. Together, we'll explore the amazing story of a brilliant translator named Hunayn ibn Ishaq, who played a pivotal role in preserving and transmitting the works of Aristotle, Galen, and other luminaries of the ancient world, as well as the brilliant philosophical treaties of Al-Kindi and the indelible mark left by this period on the development of philosophy in the Islamic world and beyond. And today, we have the honor of introducing a distinguished guest who will expound upon this fascinating world of the Greco-Arabic translation movement. He is an esteemed scholar, renowned for his expertise in the history of philosophy, and is the host of the popular podcast called The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps, where he has captivated audiences worldwide with his engaging storytelling and his deep understanding of the subjects he speaks about. He also holds two academic positions, one as the professor of philosophy in late antiquity and in the Islamic world at Ludwig Maximilian University at Munich, and the other as Professor of Ancient and Medieval Philosophy at King's College London. So without further ado, we are pleased to welcome Professor Peter Adamson, and thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation. Oh, thanks for having me on. It's a real pleasure. All right, uh, just to kind of go over your background a little bit, um, Professor Adamson, you're a prolific writer. Uh, and many of your books pertaining to the history of philosophy have been recommended to me on countless occasions. Uh, most recently, your book on Al-Razi was recommended to me uh, when I had the opportunity of interviewing Sarah Strumza. I did use parts of your book to construct some of my questions for her. Um, and uh, similarly, you're a prolific podcaster with well over 20 million downloads from what I've been able to gather. It's probably been much more, Actually, but- almost 40 million now. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Uh, which has doubled since 2019, because that was the last time I was able to find out what the it's number was. growth, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, it's because the, the more episodes there are, the more, the faster the numbers go up, right? Uh, you know, doing this work myself, I, I, I kind of see that in uh, on my own, uh, what the, what's that analytics? Um, and I also like to add that I found a quote where you stated, if I could live 10 times, I'd like to spend nine of those lives specializing in different areas of the history of philosophy. So with that said, what began your interest concerning the history of philosophy and also what motivated and inspired you to start a podcast focusing on the history of philosophy? Because you're way ahead of the game looking at when you first started in 2010 compared to what everybody's doing now. Yeah, actually, the funny thing is that I thought I might be getting in at the end of podcasts. Mm. So it was 2010, you're right. And this was way before big hits. Like, for example, there's this podcast called Serial that a lot of people, not not with a C, with an S. It's like a crime, true crime story. I've never heard it, actually. But it, it was a huge hit. And I think that came along, I don't know, five years ago or something now. Mm. And so podcasts have had a very large increase in their audience in the last decade or so but in 2010 it was kind of a niche thing and i thought well there's no reason to think this is going to keep going maybe the format will just kind of vanish and so and also i didn't have any reason to think people would listen to my podcast really in fact i remember thinking what will my fellow academics think about this that i'm like doing this podcast that's kind of a weird thing to do and then I literally decided, oh, they probably won't notice. 
-hmm. so it won't make any difference because it'll be like you know if it's really successful there'll be like 500 people listening or something <laughs> um so i underestimated the potential of it as a project and i also underestimated how long i'd be doing it how much time it would take i, under, I underestimated the whole thing uh and i probably in a way that's why i started doing it was because I didn't realize what I was getting into. And if I had, I might not have. But I mean, just to go back to your uh, the first part of your question, the reason I got into history of philosophy actually is that I got my undergraduate degree at Williams College, which is a small liberal arts college in Western Massachusetts. I'm from near Boston. Mm -hmm. So it's like three hours drive from where I grew up. And they had a very historically oriented department as it happens. So when I discovered philosophy, I kind of was under the impression that philosophy and history of philosophy are the same thing. Mm. So I don't, it was, it was never like I sort of chose between contemporary and history of philosophy is more that I fell in love with philosophy. And I, I sort of thought the question was, okay, which period should I specialize in rather than thinking about, well, do I want to be a historian of philosophy? And once I figured out that there was contemporary philosophy as well, it was kind of too late. <laughs> so I was already in grad school doing trying to be an expert on ancient and medieval philosophy. Um, but the connection maybe between my like work as a historian and the podcast is that my the areas I've worked on as a historian are kind of niche. So I've done a lot on late ancient Greek philosophy, like Neoplatonism. And then, I, as you said, I've done a lot on philosophy in the Islamic world. So these aren't, you know, completely unheard of topics, but they're somewhat off the beaten path. And I was always kind of annoyed at the way that people think that the history of philosophy sort of goes Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, Descartes, etc. And almost as if it only really gets going in the 17th century, right? And, and that's the feeling I got when I read a book called The History of Philosophy by William Durant, where he actually goes through the very characters that you go through, that you just went through uh, almost in identical order. And I can't remember because it was over 10 years ago that I read that book. He has an excellent series on world history I recommend to anybody. It's probably a little bit outdated, but it's still an entertaining read and you can find it on audiobook. But um, I, from what I remember, he didn't include any of the Islamic philosophers or the philosophers who developed in the Islamic world. And so, um, yeah, that leads me to my next question. What is it about the history of Islamic philosophy that sparked your interest in it? Um, I ask that because you appear to have researched and written on uh, such topics extensively. Mm. Yeah, the original reason I was in, I was really fascinated by it is that I was interested in Neoplatonism, which is this late ancient movement that reworks Plato's ideas, combines them with ideas from Aristotle and the Stoics, and maybe some other things, pagan religion as well. And I had this idea that it would be really cool to have a kind of comprehensive understanding of Neoplatonism as a phenomenon across the ages. And I knew already as a grad student, I could, I could see that Neoplatonism had a reception in both Arabic and Latin, as mm -hmm. well as beginning in Greek. And so I sort of busied myself learning all of these languages and I, originally, my interest in Arabic philosophy was that I wanted to study the reception of Neoplatonism. And in fact, my first book and my PhD thesis were about the translation of Plotinus, the founder of Neoplatonism, into Arabic. Mm. But I mean, once you can once you can read Arabic, obviously this whole world opens up to you. And so I increasingly started moving somewhat away from the topic that we're going to be discussing now, which is the Greek Arabic translation movement. I mean, obviously that's still very important in a lot of what I do, but increasingly I've sort of become interested in what happened in philosophy of the Islamic world after they stopped responding directly to Greek philosophy, which happens in around the 12th century. Okay. Uh, and I will have to say that, uh, you know, the translation movement is a very fascinating uh, period. Um, I don't know too much about Neoplatonism. I know that certain aspects of it crept into uh, Islam with one school, um, the Ismailis being really, really big on it. Um, it right. seems very interesting and I've only come across it recently. Uh, and philosophy is such a foreign subject, kind of foreign. I 
became more acquainted with it reading Sarah Strums's book. That was kind of an introduction. And then I also have on this channel uh, the audio book of Majid Fakhri's uh, um, introduction to Islamic, which I listened to, which kind of helped f uh, familiarize myself. But, you know, I'm hoping to learn a lot more. And like I said, uh, you have, you're a prolific podcaster and you have a lot of information out there uh, for not only my audience to indulge in, but uh, for myself. Unfortunately, I only did I only listened to your podcast that were relevant to this topic. Um, so forgive me if I might not be as astute on some of the other things that you've gone into. But like I said, I could spend days, probably for the next couple of years, listening to uh, what you've recorded. And not to go on too long, I really like how you recorded it in under 30 minutes. You know, that really makes it, and you compact it with a lot of information in there that you really you can go for yourself and research uh, volumes. So, um, you know, I, I really commend you for that. Uh, and moving on to the Abbasid era translation movement, um, how did the Abbasids take over and reloc and the relocation of the capital of the Islamic empire from Syria eastward to Iraq set in motion the beginning of the Greco-Arabic uh, translation movement? And were there any other factors involved in making it possible for such an intellectual project to flourish? Yeah, okay, actually that's a very complicated question. So maybe first we should just make sure that your viewers know who we're talking about. So after the initial rise of Islam, and the obviously there's the Prophet Muhammad, and then there are the rightly guided caliphs. So these are the first kind of um, recognized leaders of the Islamic community. Then we have the Umayyad Caliphate, and they are displaced, supplanted by the Abbasid Caliphate, who come in from Central Asia and Persia, where they have a kind of power base there. So there's a revolution, effectively. By the time the Abbasids do this, so there we're talking about the second half of the 8th century CE, by the time the Abbasids come in, Islam has already managed to spread itself over a vast geographical area. Mm -hmm. right? And in fact, the Umayyad Caliphate survives as a kind of rump political power in modern day Spain. So you, that already tells you how far Islam had spread, right? So the, um, the Abbasids are taking over a, an empire of vast size and wealth. And they have a lot of resources at their disposal. And one of the things that they put these resources into is having works of Greek science, including philosophy, translated into Arabic. So here it should be said that this project doesn't kind of just come out of nowhere or fall out of the sky as if there's no antecedent activity. What's going on is that in the Near East, in Syria especially, but also in Iraq, you have a Christian literary culture. They're mostly working in a language called Syriac, which is also a, a Semitic language like Arabic. And they have a lot of Greek manuscripts. It's worth remembering. So I think people often don't realize this, that Greek isn't only spoken in antiquity in Greece. It's spoken in Egypt, it's spoken in the Near East, it's spoken in modern day Turkey, right? The Byzantine Empire is in, is in what we can now call Turkey, obviously. Right. And in Constantinople, that's a Greek speaking empire and remains a Greek speaking empire until it falls many centuries later, right? So actually the whole Eastern Mediterranean and most of the Near East is Greek speaking. If not only Greek speaking, then at least there's a very flourishing Greek literary culture. So that means that well before the Abbasids come in, so we're talking like 6th, 7th century, you already have Christian scholars doing things like translating Aristotle and commenting on him in Syriac. Mm. So when the Abbasids start to pay people to translate Greek philosophy into Arabic, for one thing, they're mostly paying Christians to do it. In fact, they're almost only paying Christians to do it. The, the vast majority of the translators are Christians because they're already part of this ongoing movement or not movement, but tradition, literary tradition of engaging with Greek science. That's one thing. And the other thing is that they're actually often translating from Syriac and not from Greek. So there's many Arabic philosophical and scientific works that are translations of Syriac, mm -hmm. translations of Greek works. Mm. We don't always know actually which works were translated via Syriac, but in some cases we know. So I guess we're going to talk about Hunayn ibn Ishaq, who is a translator, especially of medical works. Mm. And he, if he had a Greek philosophy, a Greek scientific text, like a Greek work by Galen, 
he would translate it into Syriac. And then he or someone else in his circle would translate that into Arabic, right? So this is just how they thought about translating. They use Syriac to kind of get it into the Semitic language group. <laughs> That's obviously not how they thought about it, but we could think of it that way. And then they would turn that from Syriac into, um, into Arabic. By the way, people might have heard of the language Aramaic. Syriac is basically Aramaic, as I understand it. I, I don't actually read Syriac, but that's what we're talking about. So we're talking about a, a, a literary language of Eastern Christendom. And that whole context makes it possible for the Abbasids to basically just say, oh, well, there's all these scholars doing this kind of stuff anyway. Here's a huge amount of money. Please translate the stuff into Arabic as well. And uh, you said that comp that question was a bit uh, complicated. Uh, I'm gonna have to place the blame on Roxana because that's the one that she had uh, put together. <laughs> um, I had just kind of read it out just following the script. I apologize. Um, I wanted to ask in terms of uh, the sort of development of the, the translation movement, were there any specific um, ideological needs or tendencies of the sort of the nascent Abbasid empire that generated and sustained this movement? That's a great question. Yeah, there's a really good book on this by a scholar named Dimitri Gutas, who teaches at Yale University. And it's called Greek Thought Arabic Culture. Um, that's not really aimed at beginners, I wouldn't say, but it's still worth checking out if you're interested in this a very interesting book. And he gives several reasons why they would have been interested in this. Um, to some extent, actually, it's not that mysterious. So if you think about for example, medicine, which is Hunayn's specialty, medical literature is kind of obviously useful, right? So you, you want to recover from your diseases, you want to know how to set broken bones and so on. And so they have literature about that. They have engineering, they have, you know, um, land management, mathematics, astrology, one should not forget astrology. And they also translate Indian astrological works. So I mean, most people don't believe in astrology anymore, but it was very common then to believe in astrology. And yeah, I was surprised worked, to, it would be very useful, right? I, I was surprised that Al Mansur was so the uh, he, he was the second Abbasid caliph, but they say he was the founder of the Abbasid uh, Empire. Um, that he was so into astrology. I mean, as, as you just mentioned, um, people aren't as into it now. I mean, maybe sometimes I might read about it for kicks and giggle, but, uh, you know, uh, but people really took it seriously in trying to maintain or expand their empire or at least to hold their legitimacy. Absolutely, yeah. And that's already true in the Roman Empire. Right? I mean, there's famous stories about like Augustus having his horoscope read. And so it was actually, I mean, I was just describing it as being useful in the sense of, well, it would be useful to know the future, right? If you could do that. But actually, in a way, the usefulness of it might better be understood in terms of establishing your political legitimacy. So if you have a way of saying that the stars selected you to be the ruler, then that's a very powerful argument for legitimacy, right? Mm -hmm. So th I think that's that's before we kind of get into the ideology of it, as it were there's a lot of just practical usefulness that motivates the translation movement of course you might think well works on say metaphysics don't look so useful but i think that to some extent they kind of piggyback on all the other stuff so that you've got like science broadly considered including mathematics for example optics geometry you name it and they just think of all that as being kind of a big of all of one piece, right? So there's a kind of a understanding of Greek science as being a coherent whole, which they could just transplant into Arabic. Mm. But having said all that, there are uh, some more specific political reasons driving them. So one thing that Gutas mentions and emphasizes a lot in his book is the desire to compete with Byzantine culture. So you have a lot of kind of rhetoric in these early Arabic sources, basically along the lines of saying, well, these the Greeks used to be great. They used to have all this science, but then they became Christian <clears throat> and they became superstitious. They stopped studying logic and science, or they only studied it to a very preliminary level. And we, the hyper-rational Muslims who are very like intellectually advanced, we are going to do Greek philosophy better than the Greeks, right? Because the Byzantines are the Greeks, right? They're actually called in Arabic, they're called the Romans, right? 
Mm -hmm. That's how, what they called Byzantium, what we call Byzantium. The Byzantians, Byzantians, Byzantines rather, also called themselves the Romans in this period. Yeah. Because it's just the leftover Eastern Roman Empire, right? So the the Abbasids, who are often fighting wars with the Byzantines, wanted to present themselves as being enlightened rulers and contrast themselves to the superstitious and kind of corrupt and debased culture of Byzantium. And what better way to do that than to claim their intellectual inheritance for yourself? So that's that's another part of it there's probably more to say we could say about that but that's like a good sampling of reasons why they were interested in it yeah in, in your interview with melvin bragg uh on this very subject he had uh characterized it as a cultural imperialism i never thought about it like that it's usually muslims making the claim uh lobbying the claim on the other side for right or wrong uh it's some legit val validity in it uh but you know um to hear him put it on the Muslims. Uh, I never thought about it, but it like that, but the way you explained it and from what I've been reading, yeah, it kind of appears to be like that. I mean, I'd probably use the word appropriation rather okay. than imperialism, but yeah, I, so there's an, a similar thing that Gutas talks about is maybe competition with pre-existing Persian culture because you have like Zoroastrianism, you have a, also a Persian literary tradition and the Abbasids are using the Greek material to create a new Arabic intellectual culture, which can sort of uh, be favorably compared both to Persian culture and to Byzantine culture. Of course, this is all to some extent, I mean, none of this is sort of like cold, hard fact. These are subtle interpretations of a very complicated body of evidence, but I find Gutis's interpretations quite plausible, personally. Mm -hmm. In terms of talking about sort of ideological tendencies, one of the um, sort of key parts of the development of the Abbasids was the concept of the ulama as like a, a learned elite who were sort of indigenous to Islamic society. How much was that concept um, shaped by the translation movement? I think not very much. Actually, in a way, <laughs> the, the, but it's a really good question, actually. And it's good that you ask it because in a way, actually what we've got is a parallel development here. So remember what I just said that the translations are almost always being done by Christians. So there are Muslims involved. So Al-Kindi, who we might get on to talk about is a philosopher who's at the head of a translation circle. He's not translating himself. He's kind of coordinating translations, but even in his circle, the translators are Christians. Mm. So actually for quite some time, like maybe 200 years, after the start of the translation movement, there's a really strong association in people's minds between our Greek Greek philosophy that's been translated into Arabic. This is what they called falsafa, and Christians. So they think of this as something that Christians do, mm -hmm. and it's not that Muslims don't do it at all, but the Muslims who are doing it are not like the Muslim jurists and theologians. So the people that we would think of as the ulama are the people who are the religious scholars, right? So this is around the same time that you have, for example, the rise of Hadith scholarship. I assume your audience probably knows what that means. Yeah. Um, so collecting and verifying reports about the prophet, right? You have the beginnings of Quranic commentary. You have the rise of the legal schools. So Shafi'i, one, one of the first great legal minds is sort of around in this period. Um, and you have also, maybe most importantly, you have the rise of what's we usually call kalam, which is Islamic theology. And although, I mean, there's a lot of scholarly debate about whether Greek ideas may have indirectly influenced kalam, for example, but nobody thinks that the theologians, the mutakalimun, were mostly drawing on Greek sources explicitly. They weren't doing that. And in fact, what, what happens here is that you have this kind of rivalry between two intellectual traditions, namely one that's based on Greek science, and that's what they call falsafa. So obviously the word comes from philosophia, right? The Greek word for philosophy, but it includes science as well. So falsafa could include things like mathematics, optics, medicine, even maybe. Um, and then, so there's that. And the, and the word is even like a, a Greek loan word. So it, it sounds Greek, it sounds foreign. And then sort of against that, you've got what the ulama are doing. And we can tell this because there are cases, of, there are texts that show us that some of the members of the ulama were criticizing the use of the Greek material 
um, for example, a kindi at the beginning of his most important philosophical treatise, which is called On First Philosophy, Fil Falsafal Ula, is what it's called in Arabic. He says, well, there are these people around in my own time who are criticizing our use of this Greek material. And so he defends his use of it. And he says, famously, he says that if it's true, it doesn't matter where it comes from because the truth is the truth, right? Right. Or another example is that um, there was a Christian philosopher named Abu Bashir Mata who lived in the sort of the 9th to the 10th century. And he's the founder of a group of Christian philosophers who we call the Baghdad School, who also include the more famous Al-Farabi. And this guy, the founder of the school, Abu Bashir, got into a public debate with an expert in Arabic grammar named Sirafi. And Sirafi was basically saying that the study of Greek logic was a waste of time and is a kind of pretentious, um, it's sort of it's sort of like um, if, if as if you were making fun of Americans who like to speak French mm. and sort of eat French food and sort of show off the, like their French culture. And he's like, this is this is ridiculous. This is a waste <laughs> of time. If you want to know correct how to speak correctly, you don't need Greek logic. You need Arabic grammar, mm. right? And we have this long kind of diatribe against Abu Bishr that comes from Sadafi. So again, that would be a sign that the members of the ulama are attacking or at least voicing reluctance or some kind of disquiet in the face of this imported Greek knowledge. But eventually the, the imported Greek knowledge kind of worms its way into Islamic intellectual culture and becomes part of it. So it's a complicated process. In terms of the sort of the, the rise of the ulama, particularly what you said in relation to Kalam, um, obviously the myth now is seen as this kind of seismic event during um, the Abbasid period in relation to those two things. How much did the myth now affect the attitude of the traditional school of ulama towards the translator movement? Mm -hmm. And did al Mamun's sort of ideological campaigns, did they... Did they cause an association between dialectical theology or kalam and and, tra and the translated sciences? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. I, I mean, so first, maybe first of all, we should just say what the mihna was. So this is an event in the ninth century when the Abbasid caliphs and the key figure here that people think about is Ma'mun, but there are several Abbasid caliphs who enforce the mihna. So mihna means test, mm. and um, test in the sense of forcing people to agree with a certain doctrine. And the central doctrine is that the Quran is created. Uh, there's a, a very complicated reasons why they cared about this so much, but maybe we can skip that and just say that there was a, a kind of attempt to enforce ideological orthodoxy. And this is a doctrine that's associated with a school of Kalam that we call the Mu'tazilites. So um, the so that's happening exactly at the same time and at the same court as the people who are supporting the translation movement, mm -hmm. right? So million dollar question, what do these things have to do with each other? And the answer is that it's unclear. So part of the problem is that the mitna is a much briefer um, kind of phenomenon than the translation movement. So the translation movement really already starts in the late eighth century and goes all the way into the mid 10th century. And the reason it stops is really that they run out of things to translate. I mean, they basically do everything they've got that they can get their hands on in terms of Greek manuscripts. Um, by the way, that, that's maybe something that the viewers should bear in mind here, because people forget this. Books in this period are handwritten, or they're handmade objects. They're very, very valuable. They're very hard to get. They're like sports cars. That's what I would, that's what I would say to my students. And that's something I had no idea about until I was reading. Um, it, it actually might have been in Will Durant's book on, uh, you know, his, his series on world history, where he had mentioned that the Kitab al-Aghani, uh, uh, when it was translated in Iraq um, or written, however it came about in Iraq, uh, uh, it, uh, a caliph in Spain or um, in Muslim Spain uh, had 
requested it and uh, sent a thousand dinar or a couple thousand dinar. I figured it to today's money. It might, it was in 2015 inflation. It might've gone up, but then it was $48,000 uh, in the money I calculated then. Uh, and I was surprised that a book could cost that much. I mean, I thought an expensive book was uh, something you buy a brill for a couple hundred dollars, but mm -hmm. to see 14, uh, 48,000, uh, that just, that was just mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, actually, this is the very period in which paper comes in as a chi Chinese technology, which gets starts to get used in the Islamic world. So that greatly reduced the cost of books, mm. but they are still rare, expensive, laborious to make. Um, the translators themselves were also paid a lot of money. It was a very highly skilled, highly sought after skill. Um, so yeah, but, but I mean, getting back to the Mithna, um, the, the point I was just trying to make is that the translation movement takes maybe 250 years to unfold whereas the mihna is like a couple of decades i guess it's quite a short event and it's in the middle of the translation movement so it neither initiates nor ends the translation movement it's more that something that happens in the middle that maybe impacts it um so as it happens i wrote a paper a long time ago like maybe 20 years ago in which i argued that akindi one of the central members of the movement was responding to the mihna by writing a lot about the eternity of the world mm. in other words the whole universe right so my idea was that he has these philosophical arguments drawing on greek discussions of the same topic where he's showing that the universe cannot be eternal it must have been created by god right and my thought was that it was kind of a philosophical version of the thesis that was being required in the mihna so the Abbasid Caliph. So my idea was his bosses, the Abbasid Caliphate, Caliphs, are demanding that everyone says that the Quran is created. And he kind of comes along and says, okay, here's a bunch of philosophical arguments to show that the universe is created. And you don't need much imagination to think, okay, the point is that it's kind of the same idea. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't know that anyone thinks this is true other than me. <laughs> so, but, well, you had, uh, i think it's very plausible so. yeah you had me convinced uh, just by hearing it like yeah the universe Sounds is good, created right? everything within the universe has to be created the quran is within the universe I, that's at least how absolutely. i was thinking it so absolutely yeah the only thing is the people who denied the creativeness of the universe of, of the quran think that it's not part of the universe but it's the word of god right yeah. so it's not it's not directly proving the thesis at the middle of the mihna but it seems kind of intellectually relevant, at least. Mm. Um, and, but I think actually the long-term effect of the Mithna is probably more a matter of the fact that it failed. So it's a very unusual fact, uh, kind of event in Islamic history where you have political, secular, what we might call secular political leaders intervening in a theological dispute and requiring people to adopt a certain position on Islam and actually in medieval Islam in general, that's very rare. Mm. And maybe one reason that it is rare is that the Mithna was a huge failure, right? So they, the people who refused to cooperate became kind of heroes and were, were admired in, by later um, generations for their bravery. And eventually the, the Kavs kind of quietly dropped the policy. Mm. And I think actually that's important for understanding the development of Islamic intellectual history going forward, because both the philosophers and the theologians have a kind of freedom of thought that would have been unheard of, for example, in medieval Christian Europe. Mm. And the reason is that the basically there, there's no established church, right? There's no pope. There's no, you know, committees of bishops who are going to examine your books and burn them or burn you if you step <laughs> out of line. All you've got is jurists kind of arguing with each other and saying what you, you know, saying what is and isn't right, but it's kind of a, a free for all in this whole period. And so actually it's funny because people always assume that there was a lot of intellectual and religious persecution in medieval Islam, but actually that's not true. And this is why, right? They tried it, it didn't work. Mm. So um, in terms of, well, I suppose in terms of the idea of, of what you just said about El Kindi and the idea of like the, the eternality of the world, uh, it not being it not it not being possible and it being created at least it's the idea that anything other than god is created and you can easily transpose exactly. that idea yeah. to um to uh to the matazila sort of ideology um 
in terms of the sort of as we go forward through the history of the Abbasid period, one one another big sort of seismic change was the decentralizing decentralization of power during the Buyid era mm. away from Baghdad. Um, how did that affect the system of sort of cultural patronage when we're talking about the translation movement? And was there a sort of increasing geographical diversification of translation work instead of it all being sort of heavily located in Baghdad? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I think actually the translators are, the translations mostly still happen in Iraq, I think. Mm -hmm. But the dissemination of texts then goes in all directions. And in fact, um, you have, for example, Ibn Sina, it's often called Avicenna in English because that was his Latin, what they called him in Latin. So he dies in 1037. And he talks about as a young man going to see a library in Central Asia, which had, as he says, many books which I had never seen before and would never see again, including many translations of Greek philosophical works. Right. So that shows you that by that time, I mean, he's from Afghanistan. Right. So that shows you that books have penetrated right through Persia and out into Central Asia. And you also have, um, to jump forward another century, by the 12th century, you have a figure like Ibn Rushd, who is the great, uh, who's called Averroes often. So that's, again, his Latin name is Averroes. So he's a commentator on Aristotle. And he's got all these Aristotle translations, including translations that were done in Kindi's circle mm. in the ninth century, and translations done in Hunayn's circle, by, by Hunayn's son, Ishaq ibn Hunayn, which, who was a great Aristotle translator. And these are the versions that Ibn Rush is commenting on. So he obviously, he can't read Greek. He doesn't have Greek texts at his disposal. But he has all these translations, right? And that's in Muslim Spain. So you can see that within a few hundred years, these books get everywhere. And you're also right to highlight the point about patronage. So, for example... I mean, Ibn Sina is a great example. So I see travels around from one city to another, having various problems, even getting put in prison at one point. Uh, he attaches himself to a series of kind of local powers, or we might kind of think of them as warlords. Mm. They would have thought of themselves as princes, right? And he becomes their court doctor and philosopher, one after another. Or Arazi, who you talked to Sarah Strimsa about, he also had a um a patron who's not a caliph he's like he's like a local prince mm. or leader um actually also named mansur and he wrote books he wrote a book a great book of medicine called kitab al-mansuri which is in honor of this guy right so what you have as the i mean you're totally right so the the picture that you have moving through like the 10th and the 11th century the buyid period then also later the seljuk period is this very fragmented political situation where you have all of these local powers and the philosophers flock to these courts because that's where the money is, right? So this is how an intellectual can get paid really, really well to be, uh, if not a translator, at least an interpreter of translated texts and also to produce new material. And all of these guys are drawing very, very much on the Greek tradition. So both Razi and Ibn Sina wrote about medicine quite a lot, especially Razi, wrote a huge amount about medicine. And he's engaging very deeply with the works of Galen and other Greek doctors. And they're also thinking about Plato and Aristotle and Neoplatonic texts and so on. So that's really what they're doing. That's that's the kind of historical setting is intellectuals at courts across Central, Central Asia, Persia, Iraq, the Near East, um, attaching themselves to local powers often serving as their doctors and then writing about philosophy and medicine and other sciences uh, and i do want to ask that at during this time i know they say in ancient times a philosopher wasn't too different uh philosophers were considered natural scientists and so they would dabble in many things other than philosophy as we know it today but also medicine and and things of that nature um, so it's, it's surprise. I mean, I'm not, so, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, it's the same in this period as well. Uh, to be a philosopher, you were dabbling in medicine and not, not only just, uh, thinking and stuff like that and writing, but also, uh, engaged in more practical sciences. Yeah. So if you think, if, so we think of philosophy as being like ethics, metaphysics, epistemology, political philosophy, right? 
and they do that. They think about all that stuff. But a philosoph, that's the Arabic word for philosopher, is someone, it really, I think actually in a way it's even almost wrong to translate it as philosopher. Mm-hmm. Philosoph means someone who's engaging with the fruits of the Greek Arabic translation movement. Mm-hmm. Obviously that's not a usable translation that you could throw into a text, right? But that's really what it means at this, at least in this early period. And since that includes not just Aristotle and Plato, you know, metaphysics and ethics, but it includes mathematics and medicine and so on. Um, it's it was at least very natural for people who were philosopher to do medicine as well. It's not that they all do medicine, but a lot of them write about it at least to some extent. And some of them are even primarily doctors. So Razi would be a great example. So mm-hmm. he was he ran hospitals. He was a practicing physician. That was kind of his day job was to be a doctor. And then he wrote about philosophy on the side. Mm-hmm. Uh, do we have on record what some of the first books uh, translated were? Um, and was it only Greek? I know we term it the Greco-Arabic translation movement, mm-hmm. but uh, I, I came across works like Kalila Wadimna, uh, yeah, which, you know, came great. from India. And so, you know, just adding that into the picture were Greek works, the only ones that were translated. Right. So, I mean, first of all, let's reiterate that they were often translating from Syriac, even if the works were originally in Greek, right? So they're translating from Greek and Syriac. That's right. They're also translating from from earlier Persian, from like ancient Persian or you know Middle Persian. So the kind of Persian that existed at this time, um, and they're translating from they are translating Indian works. But I guess that the Indian works are probably always transmitted via Persian. So the mm-hmm. example you just gave, the Kalila Wadimna, which is a um, collection of fables about animals, starts out as an Indian text called the Panchatantra, and it goes, goes into Persian, and then in that goes into Arabic, and it exercises a fair amount of influence on the Arabic literary tradition. Um, so it's, it's very much a kind of polyglot culture. I think if, you're, if what you're interested in is philosophy, which is what I'm interested in, then the Greek tradition is by far the most important. They don't really engage with Indian philosophy until a contemporary of Ibn Sina named Al-Biruni this is again a, a good example of someone who who attaches himself to a kind of warlord and mm. this warlord um, named Mahmud of Ghazna penetrates into India takes a bunch of people as prisoners of war who are scholars brings them back and Biruni sits with them and collaborates with them to start translating texts like the Yoga Sutra into Arabic. So at that point, you even have translation from Sanskrit into mm. Arabic, but that's a bit later. So that's like 11th century, first half of the 11th century. Well, well not to move too sideways, I guess that explains why Al-Biruni has such a good understanding of, uh, we, we call it Hindu Hinduism today, but the religions and the culture going on in that region. Uh, from what I understand, up to that period, nobody really, at least in that side of the world, had a really good understanding of that culture and the religions in that region until al-biruni came but you were saying that the ghazna uh ruler had brought some uh indian scholars and he had sat with them that just kind of links those two things together for me um maybe i should just say biruni wrote a book called kitab al-hind which means on india the book on india and he he says in it since people in islam don't know anything about indian culture I will tell you. <laughs> and it's this huge book, which interestingly off, spends a lot of time comparing Indian and Greek culture. Mm. So he thinks, so these are these two ancient cultures, which have a lot of wisdom and philosophy, and he compares them to each other and to Islam. That's the project of the book. Uh, and I, I believe I've heard you mention elsewhere that there's a debate if how much Indian philosophy influenced Greek. Uh, it, yeah. it, that, that's that's a probably a whole nother. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, what were some of the challenges? Uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, numerously, numerous times about how uh, it was Greek translated into Syriac, translated into Arabic. Uh, I, listening to Mel- Melvin Bragg is a really good uh, interviewer. I really like listening to In Our Time and the questions he asks are very uh, cheeky in a bit. Because um, he mentioned that uh, often that they had to squeeze these Greek works into Arabic, uh, the, the way he termed it or phrased it. Um, I wonder, is that why they did it through Syriac first? Um, and I remember reading an anecdote or uh, something from 
Hunayn ibn Ishaq, who we'll speak about later, who he was writing or translating a Greek work into Syriac for his, uh, I believe, his nephew to translate into Arabic. So, yeah, just what were some of the uh, complications uh, with translating it from one language to another? Yeah. Well, I don't think it's intrinsically easier to translate into Syriac, it, just in terms of like grammar or whatever, because Syri Syriac is, an, is also a Semitic language. So it's very much like Arabic, I guess, as I say, I don't know Syriac. But um, in gen I mean, whatever Semitic language is the target, you're going to have a very hard time translating Greek into a Semitic language, right? So there are different language families, right? So this is not like translating Greek into Latin because yeah. Latin and Greek are related. So they're not a lot alike, but they're somewhat alike. Whereas Arabic, I mean, speaking as someone who grew up speaking an Indo-European language, I mean English, and who had to learn Arabic, you have to reconfigure your brain and learn a new way that a language could be, can be put together, right? Um, so inevitably that was gonna be very difficult. I think the reason they started with Syriac is just that there was already an ongoing um, you know, tradition of translating into Syriac. So they had already decided which words to use. They already had like a way of doing it. But for sure, once they start translating into Arabic, they face many challenges. So maybe the most obvious thing is vocabulary. So if you're translating scientific literature, you want to have a consistent vocabulary, right? And you can see that it took a while for that to develop. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very nice document that tells us about this, which is a work by a kindi called On Definitions. Mm. And I think people have often misunderstood the point of it. So it, it looks like a, a list. It's a list of Arabic words and with Arabic definitions. So it doesn't look at first glance like it has anything to do with the translation movement. But actually it does, because what he's doing is he's going through technical words that they've chosen to represent Greek philosophical terms. Right. And in some cases, he even gives you the Greek transliterated word that corresponds to the Arabic word that is defining. Mm. So he'll say, like, he's, he'll say, okay, here's the word for imagination, like takayul, which is Arabic for imagination. And then he says, and this is fantasia. So fantasia is imagination in Greek, right? Mm. So, so first, so, and then you can also see that the, the vocabulary that they choose sort of settles down after like maybe a hundred years and becomes much more standard. So in the time of a kindi, it's a bit of a moving target, how they're going to translate these things. Mm -hmm. But then once you get to the time of Farabi and especially in Sina, it's really settled. They've settled on which words to use for which things. Um, uh, sometimes you also have the phenomenon of words in Greek or Arabic, but but let's take the case of a, of a Greek term that might have more than one meaning, right? Mm. So we're all familiar with this, like translating from one language into another. There might be one word that seems like it means two different things mm. in the other language. So a really good example of this is the word, the Greek word eidos, which means form, as in like form and matter. So form as in shape the, the, or the configuration of something. But it also means species, like a logical, the logical notion of like the species of human as opposed mm. to genus, right? So that means that, and, and this word is used in Aristotle to mean both things. So that, but in Arabic, the word for form is sura, and the word for species is nal. Mm. So every time they come across the word idos, they have to decide to, whether to translate it as this one or this one. <laughs> Right. And so they're, so that that's just a small way in which the translators are making philosophical decisions for their readers all the time. And of course, once they've decided, you can't go back because the reader of the Arabic text doesn't know what the underlying Greek term is because they, they can't check. Right. They, they, there's no they, people don't keep the, they, they, first of all, they don't know Greek if they're not the translator. And second of all, they don't keep the Greek manuscripts. What gets transmitted is the Arabic translation. Mm -hmm. So that's one problem. Then there are problems about grammar. Um, maybe a good example is that the so like most or maybe all Indo-Germanic languages, Greek has an infinitive, which means to be, like to be a philosopher, right? Um, or I want to be a philosopher. So and this verb is ani. Mm. 
Arabic doesn't have an infinitive for it to be. So when they're confronted with discussions about how the verb to be works in Greek philosophy, which is something the Greek philosophers cared about a lot, translating that is basically impossible, right? And for example, Farabi says some really crazy stuff about how the Greek vocabulary for existence worked because he doesn't understand how their verbs functioned, yeah. right? So it's it was very, very complicated and challenging. Actually, I think um, on the whole, they did an amazingly good job um, given all these obstacles they faced. Okay, well, I mean, that really answers my next question is how faithful were these translations uh, being the difficulty of translating from one language into another. And then also I wanted to add to that was uh, being that they were producing these works for a certain audience, most of the time their patrons, uh, did they have to stylize them in a certain way so they would be a little bit more amusing or intriguing for the person <laughs> to read rather than kind of dry like most of these texts, if you were to read them today, can seem sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I think they don't they don't make them more fun, but they what they do, they maybe do something more interesting, which is that they update them intellectually. So mm. actually, I mean, first of all, I should say about the accuracy, there's different kinds of translations. So in particular, in the kindy circle, they seem to have felt very free to rework what they were translating or even add new material as they were going. So this is why I wrote this book about the Arabic translation of Plotinus, because it's not just a translation. It's more like an adaptation mm. of the text where you have like entire new paragraphs just whacked into the middle of it, which are written in exactly the same style as the translation. So you can't tell that they're not based on the source text. Oh, wow. And there are little changes in almost every sentence. And one of the things I was arguing in my book is that the author is trying to show ways in which this the, the these philosophical ideas might be relevant for the theological concerns of ninth century Iraq. Right. So they so I think they weren't trying to like um, you know, just make it more fun. They were trying to make it seem relevant and interesting. Um, you do have sometimes you get something that's a little bit more like what you're thinking, where for example, Aristotle might quote a Greek poet and then the translation will just change the example and give you an Arabic poet, mm. <laughs> right? Because I mean, what's the point of translating a line of Homer into Arabic? So you just take, you know, some famous piece of Arabic poetry that makes the same point. Okay. Uh, and moving on to a specific translator, I mean, uh, he comes up numerous times. He seems like one of the most important during this period, uh, and that is Hunayn ibn Ishaq. Uh, can you provide just a brief introduction for our audience? Uh, to this figure and his role in the Greco-Arabic translation movement? Sure. Yeah. So he's ninth century, he dies around 870. And he is really a specialist in medicine. So he's a Christian from Iraq, but he would have grown up speaking both Greek and Syriac. So he's trilingual, at least. Uh, he talks about being taught to recite Homer in Greek when he was a child, actually. So that gives you an idea of how much Hellenic culture is still alive and well, like in the ninth century in Arabic in uh, in Iraq. That's amazing, right? Um, so, he, so he also something else that's great about him is that he wrote a little treatise talking about his work as a translator. Mm -hmm. So he talks about, for example, going to great lengths to get his whole his hands on manuscripts. He talks about collating manuscripts. So collating manuscripts is, um, again. Remember, these are handwritten documents. Imagine that someone hands you an entire book and says, copy this out by hand, right? So even if you're a professional copyist, you will make mistakes and you will probably make like one mistake per page actually. Yeah. So you, you have to collate manuscripts, which means that you compare them and try to figure out which ones are correct, right? And he says that he did that. So he was very, very careful trying to get his text exactly right even the Greek original text he was trying to figure out what it should say before he would translate it. He translates pretty much into Syriac, and then he has assistants, like his nephew that he mentioned, who translate them into Arabic. He also has a son named, confusingly, so this guy who we're talking about is named Hunayn ibn Ishaq. His son is named Ishaq ibn Hunayn, because <laughs> right? ibn means son of, right? 
So it's, and Ishaq is very important for history of philosophy because he's the main Aristotle translator. Mm. So he translates a lot of Aristotle and his translations are truly excellent and are not like the Kindi circles translations. They're very faithful. They're very exact. So he gets very high marks from everyone who's thought about these translations. And yeah, because um, I like to ask, you said something about Al-Kindi and his work on definitions, and it seems like the way he translated from Greek to Arabic or how he had his translators translate from Greek to Arabic was more like transcription, uh, one to one. But uh, Ibn Hunayn is often credited with establishing a, another approach to translation. Uh, could you explain this methodology and its significance, which you kind of already yeah. explained that people like those more than the other ones. But uh, yeah, so just what is this methodology about? Yeah, so I mean, what people say, and they, they don't just say this now, they said it in the medieval period as well, is that whereas the Kindi circle often translated word for word, so that what you're getting is kind of like weird Arabic that is as close to the Greek as possible, where the Hunayn circle and, and Ishaq in particular, they would like read the Greek sentence, understand it, and think, okay, how would I say that in Arabic? Right. So the idea is you're translating the thought rather than the words. Mm. Now, obviously, that's a bit of a an over. I mean, that's more than a bit of an oversimplification. It's not just that. In fact, maybe it's not even mostly that. It's more that they've just got a better way of doing it. Right. So he's thought they thought they made more made more progress in terms of things like how are you going to capture a certain Greek grammatical constructions in Arabic, um, just his mastery of Aristotle's vocabulary, um, his consistency, the fact that he did so much probably helped him a lot, right? So he has a very, he's a very experienced translator of Aristotle. But I must say that um, if you compare like a Kindi circle version of Aristotle to Ishaq, when you read Ishaq, you kind of understand it. Whereas I have often found with the Kindi circle versions that if you can't, if you don't pick up the Greek and like look at them both side by side, then you can't really understand what the Arabic's doing, right? So it's like, once you see the Greek, you're like, oh, I see what's going on here. But of course, if you don't have the Greek, which you wouldn't, if you were a reader of the Arabic, it's very, very difficult to make sense of. Mm. And that's not true for Ishaq. So Ishaq, once you get used to it, of course, it's very dry, as you said, very technical. It is a good translation of Aristotle. Mm. And, uh, oh, sorry. Um, no, I just wanted to ask in terms of the the comparison between Ibn Shaq and um, Al-Kindi's circle and their different methodologies in terms of translation and the quality of the translations they produce, the difference in approach, did it have anything to do with the difference in the goals of their work? That's an interesting question. I mean, maybe in the sense that you might think that the Hunayn circle are more like they're almost like humanists like renaissance humanists so they're like i said he's like hunting down manuscripts he's comparing manuscripts they've got this really big um project of translating this stuff and maybe it's relevant that he's a specialist on galen in particular so he's like immersed himself in the thought and writings of this one author and he's become an expert on this author. He also writes his own medical treatises, Hunayn does. So I think that's actually a good, I've never thought about that before, but I think that's a good comparison. They're very much like Renaissance humanists, the Hunayn mm -hmm. circle. Whereas you might, I, I kind of think the Kindi circle was more like a public relations machine for the whole concept of engaging with Greek philosophy. <laughs> so they're like, look how interesting this stuff is. And maybe it's be, it might be because Kendi is a little bit sourced closer to the center of power. He's actually attached to the Abbasid court. He was the tutor of Ahmad, the son of the Caliph al Mu'attasim. So he's got he's really got his finger on the pulse of what the aristocratic Arabic speaking Abbasid society wants, and he's giving it to them. Um, he, as I said, he himself is not a translator, but he writes a lot of his own works in reaction to the greek tradition mm. so i think that there's maybe a little bit less of a philological focus and a little bit more of a kind of maybe you could call it an ideological focus in the kindy oh. circle but the, i'm kind of making this up as i'm talking now so i wouldn't i wouldn't publish what i just said <laughs> maybe later on down the road there's something kind of true about what i just said yeah <laughs>
well, something for you to develop and maybe publish later on. Yeah, uh, exactly. I have to go back to you can always podcast. reference back to this podcast for us. Absolutely, I mean, yeah. <laughs> My thanks to Roxana for posing this question. Right. <laughs> um, in terms of Al Kindi, um, obviously, I well, one thing that is quite notable about him is his sort of status as like a his academic status as like a polymath. Um, and I wondered, like, obviously, the, the translation movement had fostered quite a spirit of sort of encyclopedism in terms of multidisciplinary approaches. Mm -hmm. um, and it was did this did this sort of did this sort of ideology before Alkindi's time contribute to his sort of quite broad and synoptic view of all the sciences and philosophy and his incorporation of mathematics and science into his own philosophical argumentation. Yeah, I mean, he he is remarkably um, interdisciplinary, as we would say, say nowadays. So he writes lots about philosophy, for sure. But he writes about medicine. He writes about mathematics. He writes about astrology. He music. Music. He writes about how to make swords. He writes about how to remove stains from clothing. <laughs> so the, I mean, the guy was like really writing about everything. So he's presenting himself as this kind of universal if not genius, then universal scholar. And I, I think there's actually a, a good piece on him from many decades ago by a great scholar named Franz Rosenthal, actually the teacher of Dimitri Guta. So we talked uh, about You know, I have to show, because this is one of my prized possessions. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I bought it for 20 bucks in a Berkeley uh, used bookstore. And um, I didn't understand it when I first read it. I thought classical heritage in Islam is about a bunch of classical traditional scholars. And then I opened it and I read it like, what is this? And only with time did I come to appreciate what it was about, hence this podcast. Yeah, he's kind of the grandfather of this whole conversation, actually, or great grandfather even. Um, but uh, he, he said that he, he, had a, he had a nice point that Kindi is basically a court intellectual. So he's trying to show that he can master every aspect of Greek science, again, in order to promote the take up of Greek scientific literature in this period. Um, and so, again, you could maybe draw connections to like court philosophers or court intellectuals in other times and places like in Europe in the medieval or Renaissance period. I think that would be fair in his case. I think uh, but something else that I always uh, something else that I've argued in the past is that Kindy one reason Kindy could do that is that he didn't have a very systematic idea about how the sciences should hang together. So someone like Farabi has this very firm idea about the structure of the sciences and what like what goes where, how they depend on each other, and that would tend to discourage you from just kind of like picking stuff from all over, which is really what Kindy was doing. It was very unsystematic but very broad at the same time and you know it's it's very difficult to squeeze uh this whole era into a single podcast um and just to kind of talk about the end of the era uh how was the waning of greco arabic translation movement caused by islamic academic disciplines advancing beyond the stage uh represented by the translated works um for example in medicine physics astronomy mathematics and philosophy uh, did the translated work slowly lose their relevance and just become a part of the history of science? So it depends a little bit on the science we're talking about. So, for example, in astronomy, uh, the works, for example, of Ptolemy continue being important right along. They don't stop, right? they don't go away. But in philosophy, something happens which is was not something anyone could have anticipated. <laughs> which is that one of the greatest philosophers in the history of humankind turned up. And this is Ibn Sina, the aforementioned Ibn Sina, who, as I said, died in 1037. Um, again, people might know him by the name of Avicenna. And he's like an earth-shatteringly brilliant philosopher. Mm. So head and shoulders above everybody, basically. Um, I think certainly the most important medieval philosopher, more, more influential and... Uh, kind of decisive in terms of his impact on the history of philosophy than anyone in Christian Latin medieval philosophy. Um, and just like, a, as I say, he's, he's a giant of philosophy. And he is, on the one hand, he's taking up a lot of the ideas from the Greek sources, especially Aristotle. So he's rethinking Aristotle. But unlike a lot of the people who came before, like Kindi and Farabi, he does not write commentaries on Aristotle. Mm. Except there's a, there are a couple of uh, texts where he sort of 
gives us critical notes on Aristotle. But basically what he does is he rethinks the whole thing, even reorders the material. So he, take, he takes it in a different order. And then he produces all of these new ideas, which have, I mean, we'd have to do a whole another video on Imagina, <laughs> but it, the overall effect of that is to take a very selective approach to the fruits of the Greek Arabic translation movement and show how these ideas could be transformed to be more obviously relevant for Islam. So mm. for example, he has a philosophical account of God, which fits much better with the Quranic God than Aristotle's God does, even though it doesn't fit perfectly as people then pointed out. And he, because he's such a huge um, and such a, a brilliant figure, he really transforms the philosophical landscape. So it's people are still aware of Aristotle and they're even aware of Plato, but they see very quickly that Ibn Sina is the figure to whom they have to respond. Mm -hmm. So you have figures like al Ghazali or Fakhreddin Razi, who are great philosophers from the 11th and 12th centuries, who um, feel the need to engage critically with Ibn Sina. You also have pro Avicennans, so people who are arguing in favor of Ibn Sina, like the scientist Nasir Adina Tuzi, who refutes a lot of the criticisms that Fakhreddin made against Ibn Sina. Sorry, I know I'm throwing a lot of unfamiliar names at the viewer, but the point is that there's a whole bunch of philosophers who um, engage with Ibn Sina in the following centuries after his death. And the Gre I think the Greek Arabic translations come to seem a little bit less urgently relevant because now they've kind of been finally digested and turned into something that people can really engage with, and that's Avicennism. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, even the word falsafa, philosophy, starts to mean, instead of meaning Greek, sort of Greek-inspired philosophy, it starts to mean Avicenna's philosophy, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's not to say that the translated works go completely untouched. So for, for one thing, the situation is rather different over in Muslim Spain. So there you have Ibn Rushd in the 12th century. So he's a century after Ibn Sina. And he's, in fact, more than a century after Ibn Sina because he dies in 1198. So kind of a century and a half after Ibn Sina. And his big project is to, con is to comment on Aristotle. But he's kind of doing that as a reactionary project to sort of say, well, th this whole movement of philosophy in, in, in the Sina's image is a bad idea. We should go back to Aristotle, right? Um, also something else that you see is that this is kind of a, an odd, and I, it's a phenomenon I don't really understand, but it's very striking that in the uh, Safavid period, so this is Shiite Iran, so now we're talking about early modern period, like 17th, 16th, 17th century. There's a kind of um, resurgence of interest in the Greek Arabic translation movement. Mm. And so there's like a famous philosopher named Mullah Sadra from Safavid, Iran, who engages a lot with Greek, originally Greek texts that have been translated into Arabic. So he's still using like stuff that came out of the Kindi circle. And that's, you know, the better part of a millennium later. So that's that's really amazing. And as I say, it's not something we fully understand why in Iran there was this resurgence of interest in the Greek materials. So it doesn't go away completely ever. And even someone like Fakhreddin, when he's talking about Ibn Sina, he also talks about Aristotle and says, well, you know, Ibn Sina got this idea from Aristotle and maybe not quite convincing, right? So they're aware of it, but it's really Ibn Sina who becomes the core figure who dominates the philosophical landscape for many centuries thereafter. And it used to be said often that this was a kind of sign of some kind of collapse or decline in Islamic philosophy, but actually that's not at all true. In fact, it's, in some ways it's much more sophisticated and abundant, but the point is they're not thinking about Aristotle anymore. They're just thinking about Ibn Sina because they think he's more interesting. Mm. In terms of sort of the lasting impact, of the movement and, and just sort of to be outlined sort of the original philosophical developments that emerged out of it. Um, in terms of the the impact on on medieval and post medieval Europe specifically, mm -hmm. what how did the intellectual life of medieval and post medieval Europe profit from the Muslim translation of these sorts of texts? Yeah, that's a uh, that's another great question. 
so one thing is that the when they origin so they start getting interested again in aristotle in like the late 12th century so up until that time they have some aristotle they have some aristotle aristotelian logic they have hardly any plato and in general they don't have very much access to greek philosophy and latin translation so in the late 12th century as it happens they they start getting hold of arabic philosophical material from spain right which means that they're translating in rushd and in fact there's a kind of brief moment where they're even using for aristotle they're using latin translations of arabic aristotle Mm -hmm. because they're translating in rushd's commentary and they have the quotations of the aristotle in the arabic so they translate that too pretty quickly they realize oh no wait a minute this is ridiculous we need the greek texts and we need to start translating from greek into latin so um they have access to the manuscripts in in constantinople and they go some scholars go there so latin speaking scholars go to constantinople and translate there um and the texts start to diffuse diffuse through the 13th century um but nonetheless it remains the case that everything we've been talking about. So Kindi, Farabi, but especially Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd are hugely influential in Latin medieval philosophy. So someone like Thomas Aquinas, for example, who is maybe the other candidate for most important medieval philosopher, he would have he would be reading Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd all the time whenever he's thinking about Aristotle. He's he's he might be reading a version of Aristotle that's based on the Greek text, so Greek translated into Latin. But he's also reading Imrus commentary on Aristotle, and he's reading Ibn Sina, or he, who he would call Avicenna, right? So he's reading Averroes and Avicenna all the time, and he cites them like on every page, practically. Mm. Uh, they're, they're, his works are full of references to Averroes and Avicenna, both positively and negatively. And he's not unique in that way. So th- these two figures, especially, but also it's others, Al Ghazali, Al Farabi, Al Kindi. They all have Latin names. They're also Jewish philosophers. We haven't talked about this at all yet. So there's a there's a lot of Jewish philosophers who are influenced by all the stuff we've been talking about. So you have like Ibn Gavirol, who is called Avicebron in Latin. You have Maimonides, great Jewish philosopher, also from Muslim Spain. Um, and these people wrote in Arabic. Their works were translated into Latin. And then they also have a lot of influence on Latin scholasticism. So Latin scholasticism really is not even conceivable without the engagement that happened in the late 12th century, early 13th century with the Islamic world. That's really part of what kicks it off. And, and you mentioning um, figures such as uh, Saad Ganon and, um, and Maimonides, uh, I, I just want the audience to remember. And it caused me to change some of the wording in my questions uh, after listening to a lecture where you explained uh, what Islamic philosophy means or how you understand it, which really makes sense. And I had to change Islamic philosophy to philosophy in the Islamic world because uh, you might get the understanding that everybody doing the philosophizing, if that's a word, uh, was uh, Muslim when really there were lots of other communities contributing to this period, uh, just so people do not forget. Absolutely. I mean, we've already talked a lot about the role of Christians in this whole story, right? Uh, and Farabi's, I, I mean, I mentioned Abu Bishr Mata, and he's one of a number of Christian philosophers who were colleagues with Farabi in the 10th century. Um, but also there are Jewish philosophers in all of the spaces and times we've been talking about. So, for example, Saadi Gaon was a Jewish philosopher of the 9th and 10th century in Iraq. So he's right there when the translation movement is happening. And he's using some of the same translated material in his work. Or later on in the 12th century, you have Maimonides, who's from Muslim Spain, originally goes to Cairo because the political situation becomes uncomfortable for Jews. So his family left when he was young. And he's very engaged with Aristotle, but also with people like Farabi. So there's, there's a real kind of intermeshing of Greek, Muslim, and Christian and Jewish thought in this whole period in a way that um, often kind of gets obscured in, in books about it. So like you mentioned Majid Fakhri's book, I think, that you, that you were listening to. Yes. Right? And that's, I mean, nothing against that book, but it doesn't talk about Jewish philosophers or Christian philosophers, right? And similarly, if you pick up a, 
book on Jewish philosophy in the medieval period, it will be just the Jewish philosophers, right? Yeah. But when I covered it in the podcast and in the book based on the podcast, I put them all together because I think it's one philosophical culture and they're all talking to each other, especially the Jews are very influenced by the Muslims, not so much the other way around. Mm. Uh, and are there uh, any misconceptions or common misunderstandings about the Greco-Arabic translation movement that you would like to address? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess maybe the, the, maybe the main thing is the idea that philosophy in the Islamic world is nothing other than a response to the Greco-Arabic translation movement. Mm. So as we've said, it, that was like it had a huge impact. And in some, there is a genuinely a way in which what we might call philosophy in the Islamic world it was initiated by the translation movement. I mean, there's a whole other issue here about Kalam. And so this is the Islamic theological material we talked about before. And that's actually very philosophical a lot of the time. So I tend to think that in this period, there's kind of two philosophical traditions going on at the same time. There's falsafa, which is responding to the Greeks, and there's Kalam, which isn't, or mostly isn't. And then they kind of increasingly get tangled together. But there is this like long-standing idea, which I think is a misconception, which is that what happened in philosophy in the Islamic world is that it's kind of like just fills the gap between ancient philosophy and Latin medieval philosophy. So mm -hmm. during the dark ages over in Europe where they're, you know, they're eating mud and they're all illiterate and Monty Python, right? <laughs> So what's happening while that's all going on in, in dark Europe is that there's this flourishing culture in Islam and they engage with Greek philosophy and they do that for like four centuries from the ninth to the 12th century. And then that kind of ends, but just in time, the Latin scholastic movement gets going again. And so you kind of have ancient philosophy, Islamic philosophy, Latin philosophy, mm -hmm. that would sort of be the order. But, and there's many things wrong with that story. So for one thing, uh, the state of philosophy in the so-called dark ages was a lot better than people think. Yeah, that's what I came to find out uh, really reading that the whole dark age myth is a myth. Yeah, I mean, it's true that there, like, there isn't a lot of philosophy from the 8th century from Europe. That's true. There's just not very much textual evidence on it. But they recover pretty well by the 9th century, actually. <laughs> um, that's a whole, again, a whole other story. But the, but for our purposes, the main misconception there is the idea that philosophy just kind of falls off a cliff at the end of the 12th century. So what actually happened at the end of the 12th century is that that's when Arabic philosophical works were translated into Latin, yeah. right? So from the point of view of European, European scholars who are writing history, they looked back and they thought, oh, okay, so Islamic philosophy is like up till the end of the 12th century, because that's what influenced the Latin tradition, right? But over in Central Asia and Iran and Iraq, they don't care about that. They're thinking about Ibn Sina. Yeah. Right? As I said, that goes on for centuries, right? So, so there's no like cut. It's so it's it is true that the that the impact of the Greek Arabic translation movement wanes after the 11th, 12th century, but that's only because they've shifted their attention to a different kind of philosophy in the wake of Ibn Sina. Um. Just to to wrap this up, in this has been such a fascinating um, discussion. Um, I just wanted to end on kind of a, a sort of rounded question of the: Do you believe that there are any sort of teachings or concepts found in the Quran, in the traditions attributed to the Prophet peace be upon him, that that made Islamic society and scholarship particularly open to seeking knowledge from non-Islamic sources? Yeah, actually, I think, the, I mean, a, a great um, text to consult on this is um, a work by Ibn Rushd, who we've talked about quite a lot, called Fasl al-Makal, The Decisive Treatise, in which he argues that Islam actually requires people to do philosophy if mm. they're able to do it. And he, since it's a juridical work, it's not a philosophical treatise, it's a legal treatise. So he does what you're supposed to do as a lawyer, as a Muslim or an Islamic judge, really, is what he was. He starts by quoting the Quran and quoting Hadith, right? So he and he quotes basically verses and reports about the Prophet that encourage people to seek knowledge, right? So go like consider the world, understand the world as the 
creation of this mighty God, right? And he says, well, what is that if not an invitation to do philosophy? Mm. And I, I think the there's a, there is a, I mean, I'm not Muslim, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, 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 there's only so much I can presume to say about this, but it seems to me that there is a very strong commitment in Islam to the value of knowledge mm. and the idea that knowledge is a is is a kind of tribute to the majesty and wisdom of god right because what you're understanding is either him or you're understanding what he has made i think that's a very strong message that you get from the quran and that doesn't have to be used to support the idea of engaging with philosophy from other cultures but it certainly can be so as soon as you have the point that kindi makes um well if it's true it doesn't matter where it comes from <laughs> then you can you can easily ally this kind of translation effort to you know the sort of sentiment that you get like you know seek knowledge as far as china famous saying of the prophet right so that that kind that idea about finding knowledge however you can i think should be put into the mix along with all these other kind of ideological and practical considerations we talked about in terms of understanding why they were willing and indeed eager to do this, all the stuff that we've talked about tonight. All right, and uh, thank you for that, Professor Adamson. This has been an amazing discussion. Uh, you know, I, I can see why you graduated top of your class. You know, you, you, you're, 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 a, <laughs> you're a fountain of knowledge concerning this. I topic. didn't actually, but th but thank you anyway. <laughs> okay, well, you know, top of my class is actually. I'll tell you this: top of my class in Williams College was Nico Kolodny. Hmm. who is now a professor of philosophy at Berkeley. Okay, wow, wow. Uh, so well, that's like, what okay, Wikipedia said. You know, I was just going by the Wikipedia page. You might want to have somebody go correct that if that's not the case. No way. If it says that, I'd love it. <laughs> right, it's, it's, it's good promotion. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll take uh, whatever I can get. Right. Uh, well, hey, thank you for that. And um, we really appreciate you coming on to our, our um, channel to explain this fascinating topic. And I really hope that our audience goes and uh, not only check out your podcast, you have a lot of work on there for people to indulge for a lifetime, uh, but to also read about this topic, because it is one of the uh, greatest intellectual, one of the greatest intellectual movements in human history. So um, on that note, thank you, Professor Adamson. Thank you. And I just want to